Hello friends, welcome to this video. Today I'm going to be uh, diving into the comments that y'all have been leaving on my videos over the last week. So come along and let's, let's get into some of this. So on my video, don't switch at a second camera system, um, user Maypool commented. User Maypool Queen commented. It really depends on your lighting and other systems really. You know, gimbals, flashes, remotes, and other things. And to that I, I say thank you because that was not something, that was not part of the perspective that I was including, that was not something I was including in my perspective of the issue. Um, because that is really true. It's, it's really gonna be really hard to switch if you've, you know, built everything around a particular size camera or a particular lens selection where you can't adapt it. Um, however, there are a lot of systems, like lighting systems, that are inter that you can make work. There are a lot of uh, gimbals that will just be able to work anyway because their weight limit is good enough. There's a lot that aren't. Um, you can use most flashes as slave flashes. So, you know, if you are a Canon shooter and you have all the Canon speed lights, and then you switch to Sony, for example, you could just get one of the little, you know, pop-on hot shoe flashes to use and, and dial that in to use to trigger your other slave flashes, um, which could be a really great way to use old systems to complement a switch in what you're doing. I got a lot of comments on um, how does the 6D Mark II compare to the 5D Mark III across the videos that I made on that? Um, and there were a couple of things in particular. The, the processor, the digit processor in the 6D Mark II is better than the one in the 5D Mark III, which is kind of big. The other thing is that the banding issues in the 5D Mark III are fixed in the 6D Mark II, so that's another really big thing. Regarding my Leica TL2 video, user Miavani writes, Stop talking about how expensive it is and how you can't afford it or won't afford it. Rather, Leica is a brand that people want to buy because of the build quality, the heritage. It has value that's more than just the quality of the image or the technology within. And to that I say, you know, yes, but if you've bought into Leica, that makes sense, right? If you haven't, there are other offerings that can give you a better image for less and give you more features for less on the market. And that's kind of what my gripe is with the, the TL2, because although it looks from all respects like it's a very worthy successor to the original TL, it's gonna be very good for a Leica user, you know, a lot of ergonomics improvements, a lot of hardware improvements, it still isn't at the same level as other mirrorless APS-C cameras and even micro four thirds cameras. So user or viewer Tony Zdaralek comments that early uh, releases, I guess, early examples of 60 Mark II images show a dynamic range of 11.9. And some people might be seeing that online and, and I'd like to pump the brakes for everybody who's looking at that because one, it doesn't make business sense for Canon to come out with a camera that has a less dynamic range than the original in the series. The 6D had more dynamic range than 11.9 stops. Um, and it's also technologically, technologically unlikely. They'd have to intentionally reduce the dynamic range that they're putting in this camera, in this sensor, because the technology is good enough that it's probably actually more expensive to make a, a sensor with less dynamic range because of where all the production's at right now. Now, the other side of that is that there's this one guy who managed to find an image that is, I think, of dubious heritage, dubious provenance, because Canon wouldn't let RAW files just out from the 6D Mark II, so that's a little bit concerning. Where do you get it? Is it real? You know, big first question, is it a RAW or a JPEG? Because you can probably make any JPEG look like a RAW. The image that I saw was way over-processed, so, really highly doubting that was captured in camera like that. Um, and three, it's this one guy on a forum who's not affiliated, it doesn't look like, with DxO Mark, with DP Review, with anybody who's built a lot of credibility as someone who can deliver these numbers as, as defining for what these devices can actually do. Lens Rentals is another one of those ones. 
where the brand equity in the testing process is such that you can trust that it's true. So this guy this is just an unknown source, really, a random guy. Don't know if it's actually real. Chuck Clymer says, I don't feel this is a good comparison between your two cameras, seeing as how the 6300 is a crop sensor and the 60 is a full frame sensor. I find it insensible to buy two different bodies by two different manufacturers, not to mention having to buy lenses for both, unless you're adapting from one to the other. Even if you're doing that, you're limiting the performance of the one, seeing as how it's much more beneficial to use native lenses. If it were me, I'd just buy one body that does both really well. In my opinion, that would be a full frame Sony body. Sony A7R2 or the A9 if you have deep pockets. That's just my opinion, though. Thanks for the videos. So thank you, Chuck, for commenting. Um, I think we had a pretty good conversation in the comments, but I wanted to, you know, bring what he was saying to everybody else because not only did he disagree with me, he disagreed with me in a really approachable way. And and the thing that I want to say to that is, like, a, d a body like the A7R2 looks absolutely fantastic for both stills and video. Um, the stills might be, those those files might be a little bit too big for me to want to, you know, use when I'm shooting hundreds of pictures at a time. That might be something that's more like a few pictures at a time uh, to make it a lot easier to, to edit those um, and offload all those off of cards and everything. But that, that desire for a one body solution is really prevalent, it feels like. And I just don't believe that exists. Um, you know, I don't think the A7R2 does as good of a job at video as an ALF 6300 or an ALF 6500. And I don't think that the A9 does video as well as an ALF 6300 and an ALF 6500. I think an A7R2 does photos way better than my 6D does, but I think that, you know, a 5D Mark IV might be the only stills camera I'd ever need for the rest of my life in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, I think... I, I really like two systems. I really think that two systems are a great way to get the best of as many worlds as possible. And it is a little bit more expensive. I've managed to mitigate that by only buying one lens and adapting the rest of my Canon glass to my Sony body, and that's worked out really well for me so far. But, you know, I think, uh, I think that that's a really attractive thing, and I just don't feel like that body, that one body for everything, has really been made yet. The 1DX Mark II doesn't have C-Log, and it's $6,000. Um, 5D Mark IV's 4K is unusable. The A7R II, the file sizes are a bit too big for wanting to use on a regular basis. I don't know, there's a lot, for me anyway, there's a lot that's that's in there to all unpack, so I hope that I've addressed it, you know, as much, as shallowly, but as much as I can. Um, and I am totally willing to dive deeper into each of those later on. Hostur Lifestyle asks, uh, so when do you think the ELF 6700 is coming? Um, and, and do you think that the Alpha 6700 and the A7 III will share features? I don't think there's an ELF 6700 that's going to be coming anytime soon. I don't think that it and the A7 III will really share features. The features that they will share, the A7 III will be kind of working its way into, while I think the ELF 6700, whenever it manages to come, if it manages to come at all, is kind of going to be a camera that's oriented, um, that whose improvements aren't going to be as obvious as uh, the A7 III's. I think the A7 III is going to be the first one, first A7 series, there's A7 only, not A7S, not A7R, just A7. Uh, first in that series, it's going to have 4K. Might even have picture profiles, which would be fantastic. I think the A7 II had S-Log2. Um, I think it's going to have 100 megabits a second output for that. I think it's going to have clean HDMI. I think there's going to be a lot of really great things about it, but, you know, if the autofocus isn't on the same level, then what are you going to do if... You know, you only have five frames per second, like on every other A7 series, A7 series body, A7, A7S, A7R, A7 II, A7R2, A7S2. If it doesn't, you know, go to 10 or whatever, I mean, the A6000 series can do something like 11 on the 63 and 6500. So I don't, I don't think there's going to be anything big like that. I don't really know how the ELF 6500 can be improved apart from rolling shutter issues. So I have, I don't use one regularly. It's 6300, but 
you know, the only thing that I would want in it is a slightly deeper grip and IBIS, and that's what they fixed, and a deeper buffer. They fixed all three of those on the 6500, so don't really know. Maybe, you know, better touchscreen, better um, menus, but... So yeah, that's that's the uh, This Week in Questions. So thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Check out the links in the description. There's the LUT packs that I've made that I grade all these videos with. There's links to the gear that I have. Those are Amazon links. You can choose to get anything on Amazon through those. Then I'll get a small commission. I would really appreciate that. Um, doesn't impact the price whatsoever. Check out my Patreon page as well. Um, smash that like button, ring the notification bell. Um, so yeah, thanks for your time and for your attention. See you in the next one.